Hi, everyone who is joining us today. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to Means of Creation. This is a weekly show where we are discussing the passion economy, the creator economy, and the future of work. I'm your host, Lee, along with my co-host, Nathan. And today we're joined by Alan Lau, who is the co-founder and CEO of Wattpad, which is a social storytelling platform that enables writers to publish original stories spanning genres like romance, fantasy, young adult, mystery, historical fiction, fan fiction, poetry, and more. And Wattpad also leverages the data from its community of 90 million users to turn those stories into books, films, and TV shows through Wattpad Studios and Wattpad Books. The company was founded in 2006 and was just acquired for $600 million by Naver, which is a South Korean internet conglomerate that owns the UGC publishing platform Webtoon. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about that later in this conversation. And prior to being acquired, Wattpad had raised a total of about $117 million in VC funding. And today, Wattpad is based in Toronto, and Alan is a vocal advocate of Canada's tech scene. So thanks so much, Alan, for being here today. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. So I want to start off with your sort of origin story and founding story behind Wattpad. So you started the company in 2006. The internet looked really different back then. It was pre-mobile, pre-smartphones, um, still kind of dial-up internet, I think. So tell us about the inspiration and the founding story behind why you started this company. Yeah, I think uh, at, at that time, uh, maybe the uh, half the world, well, maybe not even half, uh, broadband internet was becoming um, quite popular. Uh, I, I think I got my first broadband in 2003 or something. Right? So it, yeah. So it was a, a quite new, but for sure, mobile internet. I, I, I was able to get a mobile internet plan at that time, but uh, uh, to download one megabyte would costing ten dollars <laughs> so yeah yeah right. uh, but anyway back to the founding story um the original idea actually started in the year 2002 uh, i was the cto and co-founder of my first company it's called team of wireless it's a mobile gaming publisher um the uh well mobile gaming publisher today means a very different thing than almost 20 years ago um, uh, we did uh, uh Initial Persian and hockey and uh, new uh, games uh, and license the brand from and uh, turn them into games, but running on the guess what the candy bar and came from uh, for those oh, wow. people <laughs> in this call you may recall that I'm uh, too young uh, uh, you may not uh, know that but at least probably when one of your parents phone and place deck on, on those phones and that's we built a gaming business. On them. That phone, but uh, I have to say, I was very passionate about the, the mobile side. I love gadgets, I still love gadgets, I will forever love gadgets. But gaming was, um, I play games, but I'm more like a casual gamer, uh, it's not truly my passion. Uh, in my spare time, I, I love to read, and uh, that's why I had this idea. Yeah, perhaps I could combine my profession and my passion turned that into a mobile reading app. And I did a, a very simple Java-based mobile reading app for the Candy Bar and Cave Room. But uh, almost instantly I knew it's way too early uh, mm -hmm. for the market. Uh, as you can imagine, I could only read two lines of text at a time to read a paragraph. I have to this yeah. is kind of like the Kindle before the Kindle yeah, yeah. existed. Yeah, it was way before everybody yeah. else. So, so uh, I, I didn't pursue the idea. And then fast forward to the year 2006, um, uh, the most popular phone at that time was the, uh, was the flip phone. So uh, instead of two lines of text, now I can read many lines of text at a time. <laughs> Luxurious. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> a curious version. It, the market is ready for me. So I uh, resurrected that idea. Well, uh, uh, and while I was busy coding in the basement, uh, now my one co founder, Ivan, uh, I'm new, uh, he uh, instant messaged me and sent me a link. And that's what he said Hey, Alan, I'm working on a new product idea. Uh, here's the link. Can you check it out and give me some feedback? I click on that link, guess what I saw? 
he was also working on a mobile reading app on the phone. So cool. Because, uh, you know, he was a, he, is, he still is a very good friend of mine and I knew him for many years. And I could not believe we were both independently working on the same thing at the same time. And I was like, one of the smartest person I have, I've ever met. So it must, if he thinks it's a good idea, I also think it's good idea that we should totally. pursue this idea. And, um, well, uh, I, would, I would love to say the rest is history, but of course, it's uh, uh, very interesting roller coaster ride. Uh, it's not always smooth sailing. Totally. What kind of, I'm curious in those kind of early days, like what kind of writing did you envision uh, people would use your platform to publish? Do, were you thinking about um, kind of like storytelling and creativity? Were you thinking about like nonfiction or blogging or personal updates? I'm just, I'm just curious kind of like what, what was the, what was the intended use almost? The, um, uh, you may know that I did not mention I, I was a writer. And I did not mention I am a writer, even though I write a lot more these days. Um, but the reason I started the company was because I love to read. And I can speak for Ivan as well. We both love to read. And if you look at my media consumption, you know, uh, video is a very small part, audio is a very small part. I, I read a lot of same for Ivan. And that's why we started the company. We built a part of ourselves we want to beat. And uh, I have to say, writing was almost an afterthought at least initially. Um, so um, uh, we were not too prescriptive in terms of the type of writing. Uh, we were um, uh, just trying to focus on the written word. And that, that's, that's what we, we, we chose. And uh, I have to say, uh, we, we think more about uh, content than the writers or the creators in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like also, truly horizontal. True, truly horizontal. Uh, yeah. And uh, one thing I do want to add is over time, um, we, we will get more traction on, on fictional and like, creative writing. Uh, and and that's, what, uh, that's what we want to focus on. Right. Yeah. It's interesting because when you started the company, I think at the, at the time, there was not really that much of a precedent for what you were supposed to write online. People were using the blogging platforms for all sorts of things, putting their personal diaries on the internet, um, just being really creative. I think of that period of the internet as being probably some of the most creative times because there was no precedent for what you were supposed to do with all of these platforms. And over time, things became a bit more templatized and standardized and there was more guidance on exactly the type of content that you were so supposed to produce. But it must have been pretty interesting to see um, with this platform in the early days, what types of stories people both wanted to create as well as to consume. Yeah, uh, so uh, initially, um, just like any other website marketplace or community, uh, we, we had the cold start problem, right? Uh, with mm -hmm. the, the writers and the content, we did not have any readers. Without any readers, no one would have any incentive to upload anything. So um, we, we had a pretty interesting way to, to bootstrap the one side of the marketplace. Uh, uh, we use uh, classic books. So, um, uh, well, because uh, two engineers uh, started a company, we had no idea uh, how to do business development or signing deals with yeah. publishers. Uh, uh, we, uh, we it's, you know, uh, after 14 years, I, I think we, we know a bit about business development now, but at that time it was a very foreign concept to us. So the easy way out uh, would be just import uh, the Prime Prejudice and all those classic mm -hmm. books uh, onto, onto our platform. And afterwards, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we, we were more reader focused in the beginning, but we knew that we had to bootstrap the supply side first. And that's why right. Classic books. Right. So it started with um, written work that was in the public domain that you could acquire without having to actually find writers and combat the to combat the cold start problem. That's right. Yeah, I've also read stats recently about how reading for leisure is on the decline 
at least in the U.S., and how the percentage of teens who are reading regularly for pleasure has decreased. And I think that's not surprising given the whole slew of entertainment options available now. Um, but I'm curious how you think about that trend um, in light of working in this market and whether uh, as a result of that, you are thinking more um, in terms of different formats of content beyond just reading. Yeah, um, I, I, would, I would say um, perhaps when they did the survey or research, they did not talk to us. <laughs> yeah. I, I, think, <laughs> I think this is the, the trend quite opposite uh, to, uh, to what we see. Um, obviously, our numbers are, are still up and to the right. Um, uh, so um, I, I would say even, even this year, last year, uh, even today, we're at record traffic, you know, we sign up more people than ever, more you NAU know, in high than ever. Uh, so I, 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 I would semi dispute this notion that young know, people don't read anymore. Uh, I would say they, they just read very differently. Um, we, what we see on our, on our own platform, uh, the type of content might not be one that you could easily buy at a bookstore or like fan fiction, yeah, maybe mm-hmm. you know, earlier, yeah, right? Uh, this is something that you can easily buy. Uh, and uh, and the, um, because the, uh, today, the, the teenagers, they are mobile native. They don't have the concept that's pre, what pre mobile internet is like. Uh, this uh, snap generation or Instagram generation, they love that feedback, they love that interaction, they love that community. That's part of who they are. And uh, on a lot of that, you know, we, uh, not only we, we have a ton of content that people upload, but one thing that we did right was um, people can comment and talk mm-hmm. yes. you know, on the per chapter or per, uh, um, paragraph basis, right? So in this type of contextual interaction and feedback, uh, we drive that flywheel uh, pretty fast, and, and that's very native to this generation. So uh, I would dispute that people don't read anymore, they do more read differently. And I would, but I would also agree, given the, the array of entertainment that people have, um, I, th- I think text or fiction text-based fiction is probably at a disadvantage. Uh, it's less shareable, less viral, uh, less racially um, uh, attractive, perhaps. Uh, this generation is more visual generated than uh, simulation <laughs> ever, right? Yeah. That's one of the reasons why we expanded ourselves uh, in, from more like publishing startup uh, that able to transform ourselves to Company. Totally. Also, one one quick note um, for the people on YouTube. I think the sound is kind of faint, and I don't know if your microphone for your computer is near enough to you, but it might help the people on YouTube to if you if you could somehow get the computer microphone a little bit closer to your voice. Sorry about that. quick, quick technical thing. We're still figuring out. Like I said, this is week three of our new AV setup, and we're um, you know we're getting there. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's complicated behind the scenes here. There's yeah, lots of Club- different microphones going on. <laughs> I know Clubhouse really needs to build a recording functionality so that we can please yes. make our workflow a little bit easier. Um, anyway, uh, yeah. Sorry. I, um, I was I was poking around on Watt- Wattpad recently, and it's really striking just the array of creativity and formats that users are playing with. Like it's a huge contrast with the type of user-generated storytelling platforms that I grew up with in the late '90s and early 2000s. Back in those days, you know, there wasn't as much images or videos inside of these UGC platforms because they would have taken an hour to download, probably. And instead, it was like complete sentences, all prose, like large blocks of text. And on Wattpad, um, recently from clicking around and checking it out, it looks like, I mean, there's some stories that are entirely text-based, like text chat, like people texting each other. Mm -hmm. Um, There's stories where it's folks who are just sharing like a cast of characters that they would cast into this story. And like which actors they would cast into the roles of different stories. Um, it's like much more multimedia, which is really fascinating. 
Yeah, I guess um, in, in a way, um, uh, because the two founders are, are not writers or aspiring writers, uh, in a way, it, it works to our advantage uh, because we 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 were not as bound by the traditional writing, for lack of a better term. Uh, we, we don't have that constraint because we don't have a preconception of how a good piece of writing software uh, or user interface would, would be like. So um, very early on, uh, we decided let's, uh, let's not build a very uh, comprehensive or sophisticated uh, um, writing or compose screen keep that very simple uh, uh, except that uh, um, of course you, you can uh, add different fonts uh, but it's very basic uh, and then over the time we we added the capability of insert animated gifs uh, because it uh, just we, we think it will uh, fit more to this generation uh, and uh, eventually YouTube video. Uh, you can embed YouTube video as well, but uh, we stay true to our original objective. Uh, keep the Compose screen that simple. And in a way that allows us to have much more flexibility than, than uh, anything else. Uh, that's why you, you see you know some of the um, uh, stories that uh, are actually quite uh, creative. Uh, some people actually write, writing comics using animated GIFs uh, um, um, directly or ex exclusively. And uh, uh, the, the comics on, on Wattpad uh, is an actually animated uh, using mm -hmm. animated GIFs. So that kind of creativity we kind of enable using, using product is actually enable that creativity. That's really cool. I, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about creator monetization. Mm -hmm. So creator monetization is kind of having its moment and all sorts of different UGC platforms are really paying attention now more so than ever before to how to enable its creators to actually monetize all of their content. And so um, my question for you is like, how does Wattpad think about creator monetization for this particular content format? Do you think monetization is a key priority or value driver for the writers on the Wattpad community? And um, yeah, maybe we'll just start there and then I have a lot of follow-up questions yeah, too. It's, it's absolutely very, very important to, to us. Uh, that being said, I, I think it's, uh, it, it's a journey. So um, uh, earlier, uh, when we built the product, I, I would say uh, even in um, uh, up until 2013, 2014, we we put more focus on the reader side because we realized for most aspiring writers, the number one thing uh, is not about money; it's about the fan base. The, mm -hmm. the because when your fan base is only uh, five people, this, the monetization opportunity is so tiny. But those five readers who come back to the platform every day uh, to, to wait for your next chapter, that will drive the flywheel, that will drive the motivation, that will encourage people to stay on the, to the platform. So uh, only when we reach uh, maybe 30, 40 million month users, that's when we start to think about monetization because what we realized at that time, uh, uh, passion, while well, it's great, it's not enough anymore. All, all, all the uh, 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 top writers on our platform, they start to realize, okay, now I got the recognition, I'm validated, uh, yeah. I can turn this into a career. Uh, what's next? How can I monetize? And and for us, we have to provide that opportunity for them to uh, to monetize. Otherwise, they could go on to other platforms to monetize or find other ways to monetize. And that's probably not the most effective because the the passionate fan base may not move with you to another platform to monetize. That's why the uh, uh, the monetization and the fan base, they have to be very, very tightly coupled. So um, that's when we uh, started to uh, introduce uh, uh, 
what we call pay stories. Uh, it's still uh, chapter by chapter monetization. Maybe the first 10 chapters or 20, uh, 20 chapters are free, but after that, uh, you pay a very nominal fee, maybe a few coins uh, uh, through our virtual currency uh, to purchase. You, you spend dollar or two to buy 100 coins or something, and each chapter is like five to ten coins or something like that. A very nominal fee so that you can uh, uh, have a very low barrier for people to pay. And if they continue to like this story behind the paywall, they'll continue to pay. Yeah, you know, almost a pay as you go. Uh, that worked quite well for us, and then we kind of combined that with our subscription uh, uh, service. Uh, so now we have. Um, uh, 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 an array of like uh, business models on our platform. You can pay a la carte, uh, but uh, you can also uh, subscribe. Uh, and through subscription, you have um, uh, uh, we give you free access to two full stories uh, per month. Uh, that's probably good enough for for you to consume for a month. And if you want uh, uh, one more, you can always purchase more coins. Um, that became a very, very effective way for us to, uh, for the writers to, to make money. We share majority of the revenue back to the writers. Uh, and then um, uh, as we start to expand into movies, TV shows, and, and print books, the off-platform monetization, that's open up another, uh, or I wouldn't say many doors for the creators to make money. Now they can actually make money, not only on our platform, but going to Barnes and Noble, they can, uh, people can buy their, their physical books, right? Um, the, the movies, they, uh, it's their IP. When we work with uh, uh, Sony Pictures, for example, to turn a story into a TV show, they would get compensated as well. So um, I, I, the, the point I want to make is uh, um, it's not necessarily a single business model, especially when we are talking about uh, entertainment. There, there are multiple forms, multiple ways mm -hmm. to, to, to adapt an IP to. And uh, uh, being able to have a multimodal business model is, is actually very important in this context. <laughs> Totally. I'm curious to hear um, what or is there like a kind of content that like maybe works better under one business model than other? Like, is there is there some content that they really want to keep it all free so that they can maximize the audience because they're pretty sure they want to like sell the IP later? Or is there another kind of content that it makes more sense to, to put behind a paywall? I'm, I'm curious if you've seen any kind of like specialization almost occur on the platform. Yes, uh, uh, a little bit, but I, I wouldn't, uh, uh, maybe I'll give a couple of examples, uh, yeah. but I, I, I would not use these two examples to broadly generalize. So um, uh, the popular stories, uh, that one, uh, I think it works better for subscription because it's broad based. Uh, I think the monetization opportunity is, is higher. This one is easy to understand, but for the, um, uh, what we've seen, at least in a, in a few cases, uh, a, a story whose uh, fan base is actually smaller, but uh, the story is longer, let's say a few hundred chapters, uh, the uh, IAP pay per chapter model actually works better mm. because uh, the, uh, we rely on the 100 fans, you know, to, to pay for mm -hmm. that. And then for the 100 fans to pay for that, uh, if the story is very short, uh, you know, you, you miss out that opportunity. If you have a sequel or a new story, you have to start selling again. Whereas yeah. if you have a much longer story, you, that monetization opportunity would, would uh, continue. It's almost like uh, Great Anatomy. <laughs> yeah, totally. Fiction, right? It never ends. Uh, so uh, right. it works well for a smaller fan base, but much more passionate fan base, kind of aligned to the hundred <laughs> fan model. Um, the uh, uh, um, yeah, I think I, I think I would use uh, these two examples to to describe. Uh, but yeah. I would I would also say um, uh, the business model uh, might be different in different geographies. For example, in Southeast Asia, in many countries, subscription is such a foreign concept. People just don't subscribe to things. Mm -hmm. right? People pay a la carte. People even buy a shampoo. They buy a small pack, they don't buy a bottle. So hmm. uh, in that type of economy, IAP works way, way, way better than subscription. 
Yeah. And over time, it, they may converge. I, I was going to ask you. So now your your new parent company, Naver, it has this really interesting property called Webtoon, which is basically this UGC platform for creating online comics, manga, anime, like kind of graphic uh, stories. And I was wondering if you could sort of um, share with us, like, how does Webtoon make money? What is the prom- like predominant revenue model there, and how does it differ versus Wattpad? Uh, Webtoon has um, uh, a stronger presence in in, in Asia, so yeah. um, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I'm, I'm new to the company, so only, uh, I'm only two weeks old uh, in mm-hmm. this company, so I also have very limited knowledge, uh, but uh, based on what I know, um, the monetization is less about subscription, but uh, mm-hmm. IAP. Um, that's reflected right. in the product itself. If you try out the product, um, uh, and uh, and for us, um, uh, I guess it's a little bit different because of the geographic distribution. Is uh, for that web tune is a little bit different. They are mostly in Asia, uh, and also have uh, quite strong presence in the U.S. Whereas uh, Wattpad is more in Southeast Asia, uh, Latin America, US uh, and Europe. Uh, so we, we um, half our users are in Asia, half or uh, Asia and Latin America, half in US and, and Europe. So we, we, we have a pretty global view and we can see uh, the, um, the difference between these two geographies. Yeah. Turn is more Asia. So I think uh, naturally uh, more IAP would, would would work well for that makes sense demographics right in-app purchases almost feels like the modern day equivalent of the victorian serialized novel right like in in the victorian era serialized fiction was really popular where one chapter essentially at a time would get published in like a weekly or monthly magazine and over time the entire novel would come together that way but people would purchase um, per issue. And so the incentive on the author's part was to really hook them in and keep them engaged and keep them reading so that they would continue purchasing. Um, Some really well-known novels were written this way, like Vanity Fair uh, from the Victorian era. Yeah, and in a way, Mm -hmm. yeah, Dickens, exactly. Dickens is the poster child for that. that. Uh, I I, I think the, the, there's something interesting about uh, business models. Um, uh, uh, I, I guess a lot of the old business models would uh, become uh, feasible again because of uh, the uh, advancement or improvements in technologies uh, like in a purchase. Uh, or, or oh, kind of I just lost chapter. you, Alan. Uh, um, there we go, you're back. Uh, yeah, I'm back. I'm back. Uh, someone's calling me. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> that happens. Yeah, that happens. I, I should turn on Do Not Disturb. I forgot. I apologize for that. But uh, anyway, uh, my um, my point is um, uh, uh, that uh, serialization and monetized through serialization was not possible until the internet, until the mobile internet, until Apple in- reinvented uh, the micropayment. Um, mm-hmm. it, because just economically, it would not make sense uh, without that. Right. Yeah, I think you made a really insightful point earlier too, which was that in the early days of Wattpad and also in the early stages of a creator's life cycle, they're not actually first and foremost thinking about monetization. Their compensation is really in the feeling of affirmation that they get from the audience and the love that they get from their readership. And I think... Um, today with all of the hype around creator monetization, I I, I don't want companies to lose sight of the fact that actually there's a whole range of non-monetary incentives that you can offer to creators that are just as meaningful and incentivizing to creators as the financial component. I think a lot of creators are doing it as a passion, as like a labor of love and just reaching an audience, building an audience, getting positive feedback um, and feeling affirmed is 
enough compensation for a lot of folks, especially earlier on. Totally. Like one form of compensation we all just got is uh, Paul joined uh, the founder of Clubhouse and it makes me feel special. And we, we don't, <laughs> we don't get that when we're publishing a podcast, we have no clue who's listening. And so, you know, it's like, I don't know, shout out Paul, <laughs> but um, it's so funny just as like a subtle example of how these things work in network systems where I'm, you know, in Wattpad, there's all sorts of mechanisms for feedback, right? Like you were talking about the like paragraph or sentence level feedback you can get from readers that's like it's meaningfully different from from publishing some text on paper and then you get a number that's like how many how many copies you sold and that's kind of like it you know other than whatever if you go out and talk to people in the world or whatever but Mm -hmm. yeah that's a reason why we call this passion economy in that sequence build the passion first and then the economy would come but yes. without the passion, without the fan base, you, it's very hard to generate uh, the, the economics. A hundred percent, yes. And there's a lot of passion out there without much economy yet. And I'm excited about new forms to help that passionate base of creators monetize. But I think in general, the passion is really widespread and, and not everyone is solely motivated about the economic piece. Um, I think the, uh, um, uh, I would also add a, a passion, uh, even though the business model may not be obvious, uh, but uh, if you can uh, garner a lot of people's time, uh, eventually there will be some interesting business model uh, emerges. It may not be obvious in the beginning. Like in, in the case of Wattpad, who would have thought uh, uh, turning uh, uh, fan fiction into into a movie would become the business model. It's only becoming obvious after the fact. Totally. Yeah. I think that's one of the most fascinating things about starting as horizontally as you did, where it was. It, it kind of reminds me of YouTube in some ways, where literally it was like there wasn't a good way to read text on a phone. You know, <laughs> like you were like, how do I create a publishing system for text? And so, and then from that, there's like very specific new genres and creative forms that can kind of like emerge. And it's like also similar on YouTube, like vlogging is obviously extremely different from movies and like these long serial novels that go on for like, you know, like a thousand chapters or whatever that have like the deep fan base that wants to follow along. Like you said, like, like Grey's Anatomy, that's like its own form. That's kind of like unique to the phone, but it's so cool to see like start... I think a lot of advice that that founders often get is like, oh, you have to pick a very specific, like, okay, who is writing, who is who is reading, like, what kind of stories are you there for? You need to like really integrate around like a hyper niche community or whatever. And like, I don't know, it seems like you don't necessarily, like a lot of the most powerful companies come out of solving almost more basic kind of like distribution challenges, right? Um, and, and kind of creating these networks. And then they're surprised by what ends up um, flowering on top of that. Totally, totally. You can can be too prescriptive uh, mm-hmm. in the beginning because uh, you you may be one of the one million users, but the collective minds of the other nine hundred ninety nine thousand people probably will outsmart you. So it's always good to crowdsource that uh, innovation, whatever that is, uh, to the crowd. Yeah. It's also really interesting to consider that I think Wattpad has had a really different path towards building its business versus most other UGC platforms out there. Most other UGC platforms took the advertising supported approach, which, you know, after a decade, um, we've all seen the incentives that that creates, Um, like business models determine the incentives and incentives are everything. And so if you are monetizing through an advertising based model that incentives incentivizes for reach and scale, that ultimately engenders very different content that people are going to create on the platform than if you monetize through coins or in-app purchases. Um, so it, it's it's interesting to consider like Wattpad is almost this alternative universe of what type of content gets created and supported when the business model changes. Yeah, we um, uh, in terms of business model, like I mentioned earlier, we uh, we in fact stay away from making money for so long. Um, uh, I, guess, I guess we uh, like six years without any meaningful monetization uh, and I, I think it turned out to be uh, 
uh, a genius move uh, on, on our side because if we were too prescriptive early on, we would have taken a very different path. And uh, by the time we uh, we were uh, seriously thinking about monetization like six, seven years ago, mm -hmm. some, uh, uh, Netflix started to take off. Uh, movie, uh, visual content or video content became uh, very, very important. Uh, 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 in a purchase uh, subscription became starting to become popular at that time, or at least feasible, maybe, maybe populist now, but right. feasible was five years ago, right? Um, uh, if we started off with, okay, we have to sell content 10 years ago, we probably would have been a big failure at that time. Right. Yeah, it's fascinating how it takes, there's like a certain amount of time for almost the, the community to mature. In, in a way, and you have to wait till it hits a certain point to to kind of get there. I'm curious, like, almost as like a counterfactual, what do you think would have happened if like, you know, in year two or, or whatever, or like year three, you had um, tried to do monetization? What path would that have taken you down? Yeah, I think the, uh, uh, we, we probably would have attracted the uh, very different type of writers. Um, and mm -hmm. example and analogy, you know, unfortunately we cannot A-B test and go back in time and test it out. Right. But um, the, I would say the, the writers on Kindle self-publishing, they, they are quite different than uh, what you can see on, on Wattpad. You know, our, our writers, they are much more, um, they, they, they write because they love to write. And people yeah. publish on Kindle publishing, self-publishing is because I want to make money. So the, these two very different reasons, in a way, um, would kind of force the company um, into a very different path. And I, I think I'm, I'm so glad that we made that choice at that time, perhaps intentionally or unintentionally. But it was, it was such a good decision um, uh, when we look back because, uh, you know, there are maybe four or five billion people who can read or write. Uh, I would say maybe 1% of them, they want to monetize. 99% of them, they read or write because they're passionate about uh, reading and writing. You know, not everyone mm -hmm. wants to be Tiger Woods, but millions of people, they love to play golf, right? I think that's the best analogy. So um, I think we, by picking the choice that we uh, uh, chose at that time, we actually captured the largest possible mark, the largest possible reading writing market that we we, we could possibly be uh, capture. Totally. Yeah, that's such a re that's such an interesting insight in terms of how those incentives and business models attract different a different profile of creator yeah. than what you would have otherwise had. Um, I get this question a lot around like, is the passion economy even a good thing? Like, because like, should our passions just remain pure and unmonetized and maybe we love them because they don't make us any money. And so the people who pursue them are genuinely in it because they enjoy doing whatever it is. I don't really know what to say to that. I, I do think that like, I mean, I think a lot of people dream of making money from what they're passionate about, but when the path to monetization becomes clearer, there certainly is um, a broader base of users who enter who are perhaps not motivated by the love of whatever craft they're doing. Yeah, I, I think I, uh, perhaps I'm speaking from my own experience, but in a way we also observe the same thing on Instagram and, and YouTube. Um, these are not binary choices. I yeah. don't, at least I don't believe they are. It's not like you are passionate about X, then you cannot make money on X. Yeah. And then vice versa. I, I think it could be, uh, in, uh, in most cases, it could be both sides, two sides of the same coin. It's just that they happen in sequence. And I would also say the, um, the modern day business models uh, that's uh, broadband internet or mobile internet has enabled in the past decade and, and a bit is the, uh, um, the, the word that we're all familiar with, freemium. 
if you are really passionate, if you don't want to monetize, that's okay. Stay at the free side of the freemium. But if you want to monetize, or if you are spending enough time, enough passion, you have enough fan base, or, or for whatever reason, you can move yourself as a creator from the free of the freemium to the medium of the freemium. That's okay too, but that's really your choice. I think the uh, in the past 10 years, this world has democratized this. It's no longer a binary choice. Uh, the creator, whether you're passionate or uh, you want to monetize, these mm -hmm. two choices are available to you simultaneously, and you can go from one to the other or do both at the same time. Yeah, I think the fluidity, especially of the way that platforms are seeming to evolve, is um, is very interesting. Like um, on Twitch, you could uh, you know like stream, and then maybe someone tips you, and you didn't even really like. It's like, oh hey, like you know, all you have to do is like connect a bank account, and you can enable tips. It's like very easy, and it's just a tip. It's like okay, that's fine, you know. And it's like the same thing on Wattpad. You may just experiment with putting one chapter behind a thing, you know it's kind of different from launching a subscription business where it's like, okay, now you're making a promise that on an ongoing basis, you're going to deliver a lot of value all the time. There's other ways to monetize than making that kind of a commitment. And I think it's such a good foot in the door for people to kind of figure out if it's for them or not. Cause I think like, you know, getting into the psychology almost of like what it's like to become a professional at something versus to just do it for fun. It does change it like for sure, mm -hmm. you know, just, speaking yeah. for myself, um, it's, um, you know, it's, it's harder in a lot of ways to be a professional boss. So you get paid. So that's the trade off. Um, that's the trade off. And it's, you know, it's different for different people, what they want, you know? Yeah, that's right. You get paid, but you cannot take a vacation. You cannot skip a week. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, it's your choice. Totally. And, and I very much agree with that sentiment that I think more consumer choice is always better than less choices available. And so I'm firmly of the belief that a world in which more creators have the option to monetize, they don't all have to take it. Some of them can purely approach it still as a hobby, what, whereas others might choose to try and make a living from it. I think a world in which that is possible and the full range of choices are available to them is better than a world in which there is no choice to go professional. Yeah. It's interesting to kind of, it's interesting to kind of like plot the options almost on a spectrum from like how much you're promising. Like tipping is, there's no promise. It's just, I'm already delivering stuff. And if you like it, you can pay, but it's like the value has already been delivered on my end, you know, as the creator. And then there's like one-offs where it's like, okay, I made a thing and I'm going to put it for sale. There's no future commitment. I already created the value. Now I'm just going to see if people want it and they can pay. And then there's subscriptions where... I'm committing indefinitely to providing value. And that's like the most stressful <laughs> version of it. Um, or even like scheduling something, right? Like if you announce, if you pre-announce something before you make it, that's, that's kind of similar, although it's like a one-off versus an ongoing commitment. But I, I think that's an interesting um, kind of like way to almost plot out the levels. And it's, it's cool that Wattpad, se it seems like you've covered all the different bases on that front for creators. Uh yeah, we, we have a lot of uh, different options. But I, I would also say we are uh, pretty much the the second episode of season one. I, I think there uh, this passion economy or helping writers to to make a living uh, is still very very early. You know. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I think uh, uh, not all the options that you just mentioned, Nathan, uh, that you just mentioned that we we have. Um, and I'm a strong believer that uh, for monetization, we cannot draw a box and ask everyone to jump into that box. Uh, and mm -hmm. so many different boxes depends on, on your choice, right? Tipping would, would work, for example, would work for more casual uh, creator, but uh, for creators who are on a schedule, they they are going to produce X every two days. You know, subscription may be the better model and it's not a one size fits all. Totally, yeah. And I think there's constantly new business model innovation happening too. Um, like I see one of the attendees here, John Palmer, he just ran this really interesting experiment where he used crypto to crowdfund an essay that he wrote. And so instead of, 
you know, just publishing the work for free or putting it behind a paywall, he did something in between, which is like actually raising funds to create the essay um, in exchange for ownership of the actual uh, work itself, which I thought was really fascinating. And I think, I think that experiment netted him like $13,000 and the work is still available and accessible and viewable by all people, even though there's a few folks who um, now actually like technically own the, the essay itself. So maybe yeah, this would be fascinating on Wattpad if people could buy essentially like equity in stories mm-hmm. where like if I'm a, if I'm an author that that has like a series or whatever that that is really good and I'm doing the next in the series now and I could crowdfund from my fans equity ownership in that series so that when more people buy they could just, they could potentially sell later for a higher price if it becomes a classic the cool thing that I love about that experiment is it orients you towards the long term because equity ownership is about like what is this asset going to be worth maybe in years or decades even you know not not just sort of like I'll pay to check it out you know what I mean so it's um yeah. it's an interesting different model it's also kind of like a digital souvenir in a way it's like a it's a cool I don't know it's interesting yeah, I, I I think this is a very very good example of uh, uh, of a, of a business model that uh, would not be possible t- ten years ago, but now is uh, because of all, all the new technologies and uh, infrastructure that is becoming possible, and that yeah. works really well for passion economy because in the past, uh, like pre Netflix day. Uh, um, uh, before subscription is content is very transactional. Remember buying songs on iTunes? There's only one way to do it is mm-hmm. transaction. I pay you X, I get back a piece of content that I can own perpetually. And, that, and that's the only model. But uh, passion economy doesn't work this way because when we talk about passion, it's about long term, a fan base. Fan base is not a moment in time. Fan base is, uh, is a longer duration. If I was a Star Wars uh, fan 10 years ago, I probably still, still am today, right? Uh, so that monetization opportunity is, in a way, recurring and perpetual. Yeah. And that's why this type of business model would work much better in this new passion economy. And that's why I'm so excited about this space because this, this space is so new and uh, totally. so many things have not been invented yet. Uh, uh, it's not just the technology, it's, uh, it's also the, the business model and human psychology. That's fascinating. Totally. A hundred percent. Yes. And I just have to call out uh, my gratitude to Alan for starting this company and being such a huge source of inspiration for me in thinking about the passion economy and writing about it. I, I think back to all of the activities that I used to do as a child for fun that I didn't used to be able to monetize. Um, and And I think Wattpad has paved the way for a large swath of people to be able to do what they love and um, earn either a side income or a full income from that. And I think that's so tremendously exciting. 